just kind of wanted to come on today to update you regarding the heart failure clinic and what's going on today. Um, so this is going to be a very casual and brief. I'm not going to keep you long. Um, just like I said, want to kind of go over what's been going on, what's new in heart failure. So our objectives for today. Sorry, let me get my PowerPoint. Okay. So our objectives for today is to talk about the heart failure team. What is heart failure? Okay, Patrick, my computer is going crazy. Bring up some <laughs> I'm making some shit. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there. That's a lot. I don't of know what's going on. Sorry, y'all. Hold on. Give me just a second. No, you're good. Okay. Let's start out again. Start it again. We're going to talk about the heart failure team, who it currently consists of, what's going on, what is heart failure, our heart failure symptoms, some guideline directed medical therapy. We're not going to get too in depth into all of this. We're just going to talk about some of the topics, a little bit of triage um, for the nurses, just some little pointers that we can use. What's new in heart failure clinic? What's new going on in heart failure? And a little bit of uh, caregiver support. So our current heart failure team consists of Dr. Balfour, Dr. Bedell, and the honorary Dr. Burma. So y'all don't tell him, but he's he knows he's been nominated unofficially. And um, myself and Vicki Murrow, she's one of our new nurse practitioners that's been over at the Nine Mile office helping us out. So she's gonna be helping us out. And um, hopefully um, if she likes it, we can convince her to stay with us um, over here at the Towers. But um, Vicki's going to be coming over soon to help us out in the heart failure clinic. And then our heart failure charge nurse is Alicia Bush, as many of you already know. We've been having a lot of help from Paula Wagner, which has been very awesome. Um, Kathy Dominguez is our chair. She runs everything heart failure clinic. And then Fran Carroll, and we don't have a pharmacist right now, so um, we are currently, they're in a, uh, changing different pharmacists in and out until they hire more pharmacists. And then di our dietitian, heart failure dietitian is Margaret Lane. So if any of you own and you hear your physician or cardiologist say that they need the dietitian, this is Margaret's name. She has an email address and um, you can reach out to her for any assistance. Margaret is with us in the Heart Failure Clinic every Tuesday and Thursday. So what is heart failure? Heart failure does not mean that your heart has stopped. Heart failure is the inability of the heart to pump the adequate amount of blood to meet the demands of the body. When this occurs, it can cause blood to back up in the heart, resulting in fluid buildup in the lungs. Heart failure can be acute or chronic. Heart failure affects millions of Americans each year. It is the most common cause of hospital admission in the United States. It is thought to be among patients age 65 or older. However, heart failure is now being seen more in our younger population. And currently in our heart failure clinic, our youngest heart failure patient is 18 years old and our oldest is 94. Heart failure is typically caused by something. So there are risk factors that cause, that we relate heart failure to. Those risk factors can include, but not limited to substance abuse, certain medications, uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, uncontrolled hypertension, obesity, arrhythmias, coronary artery disease, valvular disease, chemotherapy agents, COPD, and our inflammation or infection of the heart. 
So on your screen, you kind of see a norm, what a normal heart would look like versus a heart with um, congestive heart failure. So if you notice, the arrow is kind of pointing at the left ventricle. So it's kind of flip up back south opposite, excuse me. And so if you notice like the muscle has, or the ventricle has thickened in a patient with heart failure. And so they don't have that extra room or feeling for, for it to feel, for that left ventricle to feel. Heart failure can also result in damage to your liver and your kidneys. Patients with a severely reduced heart pumping function or a reduced ejection fraction are also at risk for sudden cardiac death. This is why you see these patients come in and they may have a life vest on or they go upstairs to EP for internal cardiac defibrillators or ICDs. So let's talk about some symptoms of heart failure. All patients are not the same. Some may present differently than others. We have to keep that in mind. And it is very important for us to listen to what our patients are telling us. Patients with heart failure will experience hypotension and typically they are symptomatic with this. They will experience abdominal distension or worsening, gradual worsening shortness of breath. So if they call in, um, just, just a, something to think about for our triage nurses, if the patient calls in and they heart failure and they tell you that they have shortness of breath and they say they just started about 15, 20 minutes ago, typically not related to heart failure because heart failure shortness of breath is gradual and it just gets worse over time. Abdominal distension and you want to ask them are they eating or is it just very little? Are they experiencing nausea or vomiting? Most patients may say they're having a lot of acid reflux. Are they coughing? Is it a productive cough? Are there are or are they not coughing up anything, just a dry hacking cough? You wanna ask your patient, are you sleeping upright? You wanna listen for this. I've been sleeping in a chair. I've been sleeping in the, on the sofa. I feel like I'm smothering if I'm lying down. Um, are they having swelling? They can't put their shoes on because their feet are, are very swollen. Has the patient experienced the weight gain? We in the heart failure clinic go by three pounds, not two, three pounds in 24 hours or five pounds from Sunday to Sunday. So that's what you wanna ask your patient. Now, if they call you and say, oh, it's Monday and I've gained three pounds since last Monday, that does not count. They, it has to be three pounds in 24 hours or five pounds from Sunday to Sunday. So when you're talking to your patients and you're asking them about their blood pressure, their weight, are they short of breath, coughing, nausea, nauseated, vomiting, or any swelling, please keep in mind that if your patient is experiencing hypotension, and they are not symptomatic, it may not require an immediate visit to the heart failure clinic. Find out if the patient can stand, can they think, can they urinate? If they are doing these things, continue current management. Please keep in mind that everyone with shortness of breath does not have heart failure. Shortness of breath, like I said earlier, is gradually, it occurs over a period of time. Other things that can cause sudden shortness of breath include atrial fibrillation, COPD, heartburn, a hernia, obesity. There are several things that can cause sudden shortness of breath. Patients experiencing symptomatic heart failure are seen frequently in the heart failure clinic. These patients require frequent visits 
to keep them out of the hospital if at all possible. That is our goal, to try to keep these patients out of the hospital, especially with the current pandemic. Treatment for heart failure. So we have basic guideline directed medical therapy from the American Heart Association, the um, College of Cardiology, and those medications include ACE inhibitors like lisinopril, ARBs or Losartan, Valsartan, Arni or your Entresto, beta blockers. There are only three beta blockers that are included in this list, and that is Basoprolol, Carbetalol, and Metoprolol Sustinate, not the tartrate, the short acting one. Those are the only three medications approved to treat heart failure. Beta blockers, I'm sorry, to treat heart failure. Aldosterone antagonists, those medications are your spironolactone and your plurinone. Typically with men, they will complain of gynecomastia with the spironolactone. So we will stop the spironolactone. You stop the spironolactone, those symptoms will eventually go away. And then maybe later during their visit, they may be started on a plurinone. A newer medication that has been recently added to our guidelines is the SGLT2 inhibitor or your Jardians and Farsiga. Those two medications are now being used to treat patients with heart failure with or without diabetes. Many of you may know this, those two medications to be or diabetic medications, and they are, but now we can, it, the FDA has approved um, those medications to be used in our patients with heart failure. Other treatment options include diuretic therapy, including thiazide diuretics, hydrolyzine and isosorbide, evabradine or colonor. We also continue to use, utilize the outpatient infusion center in tower three on the second floor. So here's a chart, and I know it's kind of busy, but this is the guideline directed medical therapy, which we just went over for heart failure patients with a reduced ejection fraction, less than, four, less than 40%. So the goal is to start these patients off on an ACE, an ARB, or Entresto. So lisinopril, Losartan, or Entresto. We want to start them there first. Most cardiologists will try to start the patient. If they're not experiencing symptoms, they will try to start these patients off on a beta blocker if they're not decompensated. Once we have these patients on the medications, um, typically the, the cardiologists will refer the patients to the heart failure clinic to continue to titrate patients on the appropriate medications. I do want to mention as well on those SGLT2 inhibitors like Farsiga and Jardians, there have been two trials, the DAPA-HF trial and the EMPEROR trial, which have looked at these medications and approve, for approval for heart failure patients um, with re reduced ejection fraction with a primary outcome to reduce cardiovascular death as well as hospitalization in heart failure patients. So what's new? So advanced therapies is not new for heart failure, but I did want to let you all know that we currently have four patients that we're managing in the heart failure clinic who have LVADs or left ventricular assistive device or a mechanical heart. And we monitor these patients closely. They have to have lab work done weekly. Um, currently, one of our patients is being managed through Oshner's. He's getting ready for um, a heart transplant soon. We have two from Shans in Tallahassee, I believe, and one from Mayo Clinic. So, um, and then we have two other patients that one is going to UAB soon and another one at Mayo Clinic. 
so we have a lot going on with those advanced therapies and we work very closely with the LVAD coordinators to manage these patients. We also recently completed a research study utilizing smart watches, which Patrick showed you earlier, for heart failure patients with or without arrhythmias. The patients were able to keep their smart watch at the end of the research. This was a gift to them. The research did show that there were some inconsistencies with the blood pressure readings on the watches. However, the oxygen saturation was okay. The heart rate and the EKG readings were accurate utilizing the smart watches. So what else is new? I know many of you have probably heard about CardioMEMS. So CardioMEMS is a very tiny magnetic device inserted into the pulmonary artery via a right heart catheterization for patients with heart failure. These patients have a reduced ejection fraction or a preserved ejection fraction. Dr. Jaluk and Dr. Carter are the ones who implant these devices. The CardioMEMS actually monitors changes in the pulmonary artery, which alerts us to worsening heart failure. Research studies have been done, one including um, one being from JAMA Cardiology 2019, which was entitled Associations of Ambulatory Hemodynamics Monitoring with Clinical Outcomes and a Concurrent sorry, Match for Heart Failure Analysis to show how the CardioMEMS has assisted in reducing heart failure, hospitalization, and mortality, as well as improving a patient's quality of life. So just to kind of give you an idea of what this looks like, this is the actual CardioMEMS system. Um, it's actually the middle part that you see there, that's a magnet. That magnet is um, only activated when the patient lies on their pillow, which I'll show you soon. Um, other than that, it does not do anything but rest in the pulmonary artery. So here is a picture of the pillow that the patients are given once they have the um, cardiomems placed. The patient does not have to sleep on this pillow. It, it's like a wedge pillow, comes in a nice little travel case. And so the patient just lies on the pillow for a couple of minutes every day. We like for them to lie on it every day. And it gives us readings on how um, their fluid levels within their pulmonary artery are doing. We set goals for these patients. And so we're able to manage them via the computer. So here on your screen, um, like I said, we monitor these patients online through Merlin. We currently have four patients with cardiomems and they are doing very well. Since the device has been implanted, these patients have not been readmitted to the hospital for decompensated heart failure, or have they experienced an emergency room visit for shortness of breath or swelling. So on your screen, you see a kind of guide that will give you, um, if the patient did not have the cardiomem system, typically by the time they go to the emergency room, they're in this red area here. They're decompensated, they're feeling bad. So what happens is here, when they start experiencing changes, the patient may not feel it, but we started notice, noticing their diastolic PA or pulmonary artery diastolic pressures going upward. So once they start to trend upward here is when we start calling and adjusting medications. So to keep them from going to this stage. So caregiver support, as a reminder for our team, not only are our patients under stress with their illness, however, we must remember that the caregivers are also affected as well. Life, life is often seen as a chore for many. So imagine adding, adding the illness of a loved one. Taking care of a loved one can be a very stressful event for those of us with a med even for those of us with a medical background. When we're talking to our caregivers, please remember that caring for a 
loved one who is ill can be a very stressful event. And as a healthcare provider, we should not take this for granted. So the heart failure clinic does have a cell phone that is carried by the heart failure nurses every day. The patient, this is for patients who are seen in the heart, seen and followed in the heart failure clinic. Um, we answer this phone Monday through Friday from eight to five. The patients are educated on, you know, if they can leave, when they leave messages, if it's an emergency, they utilize our current cardiology um, our main line so they can get an off an on-call um, nurse practitioner or a cardiologist. But if it's through the week, then we utilize our heart failure cell phone. So we're going to wrap it up. Um, so just want to give you a, a good reminder that working, we are working together as a team. We are a heart of resilience. So individuals who are resilient are not defined by adversity. We find ways to move forward even though, even through difficult times and COVID-19 has been a very difficult time for many. And we try to recognize these times as just temporary. Together, we should help one another through these times by offering a kind word, writing a small note of appreciation, offering assistance to lighten someone else's load, so remember, you are not alone. We are one heart working together. Thank you. So just before we go, I'm going to let Patrick come back and tell us who our winner is for our smart watch. And then we will take some questions if anyone has any questions. Patrick, are you there? Uh, yes, I am Tanetta, and thank you so much for that awesome presentation. Now, I have all the names. They're all in front of me right here. Very, very scientifically going to look at the one random name for the drawing. The winner is none other than... Oh, wait, I clicked on an employee ID. One, two, two... 887. Let me see if we figured out who that is yet. Who? It's Tisha! Tish, yay! She's our winner! 122887. Is that you, Tisha? I'm pretty certain it is. Tisha's the winner. Congratulations. I appreciate you all once again. Thank you, Tanetta, for giving us this education. I'm going to go ahead and send the recording out to the team and if that is it, I will deliver Tisha her V19 smartwatch. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.